Hey, hi, good evening. Um, thank you for having me here. Like Copenhagen is a beautiful city, but my goodness, so cold. So um, apologies for the jacket. Um, so I'm Matt. I'm going to be talking about post-truth, which is this kind of state we find ourselves now where facts are maybe less important than the emotion that goes around them. And it's the condition we live in that has resulted in Trump and Brexit and all that kind of thing. Uh, rather than kind of diving into post-truth itself, which is maybe a bit heavy for a Friday night, um, I want to talk about some kind of technology trends that are kind of leading into this and see if it sheds any light on, on where we are now. Anyway, like I said, so I'm, I'm Matt. Uh, I'm from the UK. Um, this is the, the Queen <laughs> in the UK. This is the Queen eye rolling. I feel somehow this is not respectful enough. Should be in a big gold frame or something. So <laughs> this eye roll obviously is not real, right? Um, it's a demo image uh, from a technique called deep warp. See the paper, photorealistic image resynthesis for gaze manipulation. Uh, it's from an institute back in 2016. Um, it looks super realistic, okay? Even the little muscles around the eyes, you can see them moving. There's been a lot done in facial synthesis recently. So this is one that's done as a live video, um, also from 2016. It's called Face to Face. Uh, let me just tell you a little about what's going on here. Uh, so at the bottom left, that's uh, George Bush, George W. Bush. He's not, you know, he's not a participant in this. This is just a recording of him from an interview. The top left, that is, that is somebody who's a researcher, who's, a, who's an actor. And on the right-hand side, you can see the video has been kind of put together. So it's George Bush wearing somebody else's expressions. It looks like it's him, but it never happened. This video has now, uh, this technique has now come out of academia and been assembled into some software called Deepfake, which is now widely available. It can be used to create a composite of an actor and a celebrity and create a video of something that never occurred. Combined with another piece of software called Liarbird, which does the same thing for voice, uh, you can make videos that seem like anyone you want is saying anything you want. Now, the video here was made by BuzzFeed as a demonstration of this technique, and it's, it's a joke, uh, but deepfake is being used for fake pornography, and the political implications are serious enough that the Department of Defense in the US is investigating how to investigate these videos. Uh, the upshot is that in 2018, if you see a video that relies for its meaning on the person in it, where its credibility rests on their image or their voice, uh, you can no longer trust it. Synthesis isn't just for video. Um, early this year, I don't know whether you saw this in um, early in 2018, uh, Google announced their new technology uh, called Duplex. I'm not going to play the sound right now, but I'll describe to you what happens in the demo. Uh, what happens is you want to book a restaurant, let's say, with your, your Google Home. And then the Google AI on your behalf phones up the restaurant and has a conversation with the person in the restaurant. Uh, it navigates what time the table is for, how many people, goes through alternatives, um, all speaking, all a computer-generated voice. This is incredible technology that has potential to be really useful you know, to really start kind of opening up the world a little bit more. What was controversial about the demo is the machine never revealed that it, that it was a machine. Is it OK that the person in the restaurant doesn't know whether they're talking to a human or machine? Humans, you know, we try and treat each other fairly, right? So let's pretend the machine puts on a voice which is anxious or desperate, kind of begging for a table, uh, would that be fair? If the machine is phoning a 1,000 restaurants simultaneously, is that fair? If you decide to do somebody a favor over the phone because they sound like they really need it, and you feel good about yourself, and then later you find out you were talking to a machine with no feelings, how would you feel? And would you be likely to do favors for people over the phone again? I'll give you a couple more examples about how the boundaries are breaking down between humans and machines online. Uh, this is a product called Invisible Boyfriend. 
So let's say your family is hassling you to have a boyfriend, uh, and that's not what you want in your life right now. Uh, what you can do is you can sign up for this service, and you get all the evidence of having a boyfriend without the actual hassle of having to deal with one. So you get text messages arranging dinner, uh, confirmation that you met at the bar where you've told your friends and family where you met. You talk about your day, there's a bit of emotional support. Uh, it's $25 a month uh, for 200 text messages. Uh, how does it work? You are actually kind of talking to a real human. The text message, when you send it, gets routed to like the text message equivalent of a call center and chopped up depending on who's working. One boyfriend might actually be six or seven people time slicing the relationship. So to you, it feels like it's a single person to person relationship because it shows up as a single conversation. But you're kind of speaking to a collage, right? A composite human, a kind of a hive mind. $25 a month. This has been weaponized. Uh, the confusion over whether you're talking to a machine or a, or a human um, does kind of trip us up. This is David Jones on, on Twitter. Uh, he's from Southampton, which is my hometown, and I'm delighted. I think this is probably the first time that Southampton in the UK has been mentioned twice on stage in the same evening. Um, huge respect for Wendy Hall as well, bit of a uh, a hero, you know, from, the, uh, from my hometown, so I'm really pleased. Um, but I feel like I have some connection, right, to David Jones. I, I grew up in Southampton, I, I, I know the kind of people who walk down the streets, you know. I feel like I recognize, I want to listen. 100,000 followers, tweeting since 2013. Um, David Jones was also central to the uh, Brexit referendum. So two years ago, during the, during the debates, the whole country gets involved, very polarizing. Uh, David Jones's messages were very pro-Brexit, very pro-leaving, um, retweeted widely, a part of all of these conversations, uh, sowing a, you know, a lot of kind of division and, and building the argument. So someone like this, uh, it, it can really help shift the mood. Only recently, Another Twitter user, uh, Conspirator Zero, did some research into David Jones's tweets and what time he posted them. This is a frequency plot of David Jones's tweets. It uh, shows what time he posted, how many messages, when. And it turns out that David Jones only tweets during Moscow office hours. No late night tweets in front of the TV. No early mornings, just 8 a.m to 8 p.m. Moscow time, which, by the way, is three hours away from UK time. Once this was revealed, David Jones shut the account and disappeared. I say his account, do I mean his, right? Was this the invisible boyfriend of propaganda? Like, I've worked in marketing, right? This is how you sell butter. Like, we should be able to recognize this stuff. OK, one, one final example. Um, the same uh, bot technology uh, is also used to create um, artificial intelligence executive assistants. Basically, what happens is uh, it's an AI that will organize your meetings for you. Um, so you're, you're, you're emailing someone you want to meet. Uh, you arrange that you are going to meet. You CC um, this AI, which appears to be uh, a real person. And then it jumps in and takes over the conversation are speaking in regular, normal language, regular English, uh, to the person you're meeting. So it's a, it's a neat bit of technology, you know, time-saving, all the rest. So last year, I had a, a meeting with an investor in, uh, in the States uh, who happens to be one of the investors in one of the major companies uh, building these AI executive assistants. And sure enough, halfway through the conversation, um, this person uh, jumps in, and helps me arrange the meeting. And once the meeting was arranged, I thought, do I say thank you? Like, this investor I'm meeting is, is still CC'd, right? If, if I say thank you to a machine, do I look naive, like I don't know what's going on? 
If I don't say thank you, and it turns out it's a human, like, do I just look really rude? I'm aware this is a very British response to technology, to agonize about how polite I'm being. Um, in the event, I decided to say thank you, uh, which was fortunate because I turned up, and it was the receptionist who has just perfect email manner and was very much a human being, as far as I could tell. The sociologist uh, Sherry Turkle has pointed out that if we get accustomed to treating machines as if they don't have feelings, then we'll start treating humans who inhabit machine roles also as if they don't have feelings. So we'll be abrupt with people working in call centers because you know, that, that becomes our habit. And this is the new kids edition of the Amazon Echo Dot. Um, it has a feature called Magic Word, uh, where it won't respond to a request without you saying the word please. Uh, this is because parents were seeing their kids develop the habit of barking out orders, right? And then treating humans in the same way. I don't know whether this is a good thing or not. Um, this is the cartoon that was mentioned before. Uh, it's the cartoon from the New, New Yorker, uh, 1993, exactly 25 years ago, uh, Peter Steiner. Uh, the caption reads, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. It's still the truest thing that has ever been said about the internet. <laughs> Not only does nobody know whether you're a dog, but our technology kind of wants to make it harder and harder to tell whether you're talking to a dog or not. We kind of regard machines that don't act as machines as kind of a bug that we want to fix. We want to make our interfaces more and more indistinguishable from humans. There is another way. It doesn't need to be like that. This is Twitter art. Uh, these are generated landscapes. I'm um, created and uh, automatically and published hourly. Uh, one landscape every hour, on the hour. Uh, this is by at wildflowerbot. Uh, here's another. So this goes on all day, every week, every month, every year. Uh, here's, a, here's another one. Um, so there's a large community of Twitter artists making these bots, right? And um, this one automatically post descriptions of people taken from the American census. Uh, one person, every hour, every day, every week, every year. I carpool with another person. I got married in 1986. I had less than two weeks off last year. Here's another. It's like an empathy machine, right? Last time I got married was in 2001. There's no pretense this is a human. I mean, it can't be a human, right? Despite being in the first person, uh, it's clearly a machine, and you can tell because of the abundance, right? No, no person could be posting uh, this many different stories continuously on Twitter. It's taking advantage of something only a machine can do. <laughs> um, there's a group of artists on Twitter uh, who are probing what it means to be an act like a machine. So this is Darius, who's an important artist in the field, I, I, talking about abundance and code. I kind of want to read out something he said. Um, a simple for loop, so uh, the coders in the audience will know a for loop. A simple for loop can, in a few seconds, generate more information than a human being can consume in a lifetime. When we make art with code, we have to confront this fact. How do you compose for infinity? I love there are people thinking about this. I'll show you one more. Um, this is Uncharted Atlas by Martin O'Leary. Each one of these maps is generated by code that, that, that Martin wrote. Every hour, it generates a new map, a new place of someone that doesn't exist. Uh, the code, the way this works, is a simulation of a landscape. It simulates rivers, rainfall, and coastline erosion. He's built a simulation of how human language works, what phonemes work well together. Uh, how we talk about places, which ones become popular and which ones don't. It's clear that all the places are from the same society, even though we don't recognize these nonsense words. And I love these, right? 
I want to visit them, even though, clearly, they don't exist. Martin, as a member of this uh, Twitter artist group, is very clear about what he's doing. He wrote a fantastic essay about bot ethics. These are, these are bots that they're making. Um, and let me read you a quote uh, from his essay. He said, when we insert a machine into a social environment, we must bear in mind that the machine is in some respects superhuman. It does not tire or bore, and it is capable of acting on a scale that no human could match. It seems to me that all the examples I showed at the beginning are not just hiding what a machine is, they aren't really taking advantage of it. Machines are magical, but all those examples were instead creating confusion. One more quote, uh, this one from Alexis Lloyd, who was working at the New York Times labs at the time, and in her work environment, introduced a number of bots uh, to help them work. And she wrote an essay talking about what it was like working with a machine as a colleague. She said, we are beginning to understand machine subjectivity in a way that is in keeping with its nature, rather than forcing it into other constructs, like a person or an animal. She pondered how we relate to a machine, like a charming alien, perhaps. So here's what these Twitter artists are telling us. Just because something appears on the stage of a social network, that does not mean it's human. But just because something isn't human, doesn't mean it gets to ignore human ethics. This art movement is called Bot Ally, hashtag Bot Ally. And what it reminds me of most is Dadaism. So Dada that led to surrealism, uh, the art of the absurd, um, founded by Hugo Ball, this guy, nice hat, a uh, hundred years ago. And the way he founded it in uh, 1916, uh, on the stage of the Cabaret Voltaire in uh, Zurich, in the middle of the Great War, uh, was he got up and he recited his new poem. And his poem was so powerful, it created an art movement that we can remember uh, a century later. So uh, I'll show you his poem. It's nonsense. The poem makes no sense. In no language, it's just random sounds. But what it does is it does something really powerful. The stage is granted authority. We're used to somebody standing on a stage having, having some authority, right? Being worth listening to. That you should, you should listen to what they say. What Ball did with his poem is undermine that. From then on, you could never look at somebody on a stage and go, oh, I kind of hear what they're saying, but like, they could be saying nonsense. They could be saying a nonsense poem. The stage adds nothing to what they're saying. He undermined all that kind of inherited authority. So this is where it all takes me, this kind of investigation into uh, the nature of bots and machines and art. Just because somebody is speaking like a human, on a social network like a human, it doesn't mean they are human with human feelings and human motives. They could be a machine or a brand or a company, and companies do definitely do not have the same motives that us humans do. Or it could be a person who's in marketing mode or a propaganda agency or a compound human. We get the majority of our sense of reality now from Instagram accounts, but they're trying to be influencers or newspapers with hidden agendas or advertisers pretending to be scientists. And then we're let down, and this kind of creates a kind of a paranoia or a confusion, a kind of a gaslit state into which rushes in this primitive search for truth, and we start listening to loud voices because we assume they have authority or anything that just makes sense to our senses, because that's now the only thing we can trust. We have people believing in the flat earth conspiracy, and who can blame them? Because from where I'm standing, the world does look flat, and I can no longer trust any of these experts. I can't give you a strategy for how to fix the effects of post-truth, how to rebuild our democracy, or how to get rid of conspiracy theorists, or reduce the rise of the far right. But what I can recommend is how to individually cope, and that's to find a way to remember that humans aren't humans unless you're face-to-face, -face, that you can see them and you can touch them. 
Everything else has kind of motives that are hidden or an unreality that will lead to uncertainty and paranoia. And that's a low-level effect that causes conspiracy theories in some of us and a tiny amount of stress in everyone else. So a small thing you can do is consume more art. Follow some bots on Twitter. Because like Dada, they'll remind you that be just because something appears on the stage of a social network, you mustn't give them the authority of a real human that you meet face to face. I want to make one last point. And this was some surrealist art which followed Dada. And this form of art let us move beyond the purely representational and find out what the image could really do. The reason we have post-truth is that every day online, we don't speak the truth. We say friend online, but really we mean a small square image and a list of text. No real feelings, no pheromones, no consequences. I can say all kinds of nonsense online and nobody will punch me in the face or walk out on me and make me feel bad. So we're confused and gaslit deep down. And we wouldn't be if we started with the original truth, to treat people as people, user accounts as user accounts, and machines, no matter how magical, as just machines. My feeling is that we should find new words to talk about what's happening online. Because I'm not listening to a voice, not with a brain and empathy behind it, but a synthesis designed by a team. I think the strategy to really cope with post-truth is to be more precise with our language, not just to avoid being tricked, but to allow our machines to grow into what they truly are. So this isn't a retreat from technology. I don't want to kind of end with that. It's finding something new. Uh, finding a true machine subjectivity is going to be a challenge as grand and as wonderful and as new as the invention of the machine in the first place. I'll leave it here, but one plug first. If you're British, I run an anti-Brexit campaign. We do a sit-out every Wednesday night outside the Houses of Parliament. Come join us. We have a picnic. It's great fun. BrexitDoesn'tAddUp.com. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>